Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Now, dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the time that we have this morning to open your word together. And uh, we look forward to the fellowship and the things um, that you will show us from your word that will encourage us and help us for the trials that we face in, in the day. Uh, we pray for one another. We know, Lord, that um, we have a need of many things in our lives, but we need um, to be close to Christ. We need your presence. We need your character. And we ask, Lord, that through feeding upon your word, we can be nourished. Help us today as we study, lead it in this study so that we can see things clear. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So, you know, I've already got a head start. I got up at three o'clock this morning. So, so I've been studying for a little bit. I noticed a couple of things. So when we were finishing off yesterday, we were dealing with the 45 years. Um, so that's in verse, I guess, in verse 36, where it talks about that. So we were addressing that a little bit. And there was, uh, I think it was just in verse 36, but we were... Anyway, we were discussing this period of 45 years. Now, I was going back over some of these numbers. Uh, I just put that chart in there that we had drawn out uh, the other day. So we got uh, that in there. Um, so we dealt with, um, yes, it's right here in verse 34. Now, when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. So we had looked at this number. We had uh, added these together. Uh, the 5826, the 4592, and the 5828. And when we do that, we get the number 16,246. It's uh, footnote 44 there at the bottom. And 16,246, if we divide it by 360, we get 45 prophetic years and 46 days. So I thought that was significant in addressing uh, the 1290 and the 1335. And when we go back over the context of this, we know that there is this 1260 years and there's this help that's given. Now we know at the end of the 1260 that persecution is full, fully ceased. And then it's going to talk about this next verse, uh, next part of this verse, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge them, to make them white. So we know that that's bringing us uh, to the end of the 1260 and also to this testing of these two classes, right? So the three angels message is going to come to test the Protestants. We know that some cleave to the papacy because of these flatteries. And these flatteries would be these, you know, blandishments such as degrees and you know scholarly recognition and so forth that happens with the christian churches so the christian churches at that time especially some of the uh, the more um like you know anglican and so forth even though they may speak against catholicism in some ways they're just copying catholicism obviously with sunday and other beliefs so then we have this three angels message uh, that's going to be testing them and that's that's going to be this period from 1798 to 1844. So we know that's a period of 46 years. But it's also connected to the 1290 and 1335. So the end of the 1290 to the end of the 1335 is, as a symbol, 45 years. And then you have uh, uh, 46 years to 1844. So just the historical application of that. <coughs> is supported with this idea of that they shall be hoping with a little help gives us 45 prophetic years in 46 days. So it gives us that transition of 45 and 46. Now, we also address that in verse 36, but we're going to kind of go back here because we need to address these flatteries. And is there any other loose ends that we need to tie up from the study regarding the 45? So we go back to the, some of them shall cleave to them with flatteries. So the idea of the flatteries 
is it's going to be something that occurs during the Dark Ages as well or during the 1260. So when we go back to verse 32, and such as do wickedly against the covenant, shall he, that is the papacy, the spiritual king of the north, corrupt by flatteries. So that's flatter with prospects of position and material gain. Now we put here that this is addressing the time of the Sunday law in the USA. So in the, in the present truth application of these verses, we're saying that these are societal, social, uh, buy and sell incentives to observe the Sunday. Uh, but the people that know their God, the woman in the wilderness, historically, in our position, it's the 144,000, shall be strong and do, right? Which means that they're going to continue to follow God. And the faithful followers will remain faithful, preach the truth with many, many, many converts in the historical application. That's what happened. But we're saying that this is a reference to the loud cry. And they that understand, so again, this is just going to talk about 144,000 among the people. Christian Seventh-day Adventists shall instruct many. That's going to be the message of July 18, 2020, that they, the faithful, shall fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, and by spoil. Many days. So we, we looked at the numbers dealing with that. These symbols, they all re are represented. Uh, here in this chart and in the footnotes. So this is just the, the chronological structure of that. And um, you have to kind of look in the footnotes. I'm going to add some things to this here just to make it clear. But that's instruct many as the 8,222 days, which is 187 days and 22 years. So symbolizes July 18, 2020. And, and so lots of these other symbols, these words, these different progressive destruction of four are going to uh, be represented as symbols of the cross and of our message. OK, so when we get to uh, verse 35, uh, this is the end of verse 34, uh, they shall clean, cleave to them with flatteries. We can see historically that this is. This is the way the Catholic Church is operating. So the people that are cleaving uh, to them with flatteries. Now it says to them, so it doesn't say to him. And so how do we address it that it's, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. What did we say this them was? We have to go back a bit. Such as do wickedly against the covenant, right? Historically. So, it, those are the ones that are going to be corrupted by flatteries. And then in the period after 1798, we're going to see that there are some that are going to cleave to those that are corrupted by flatteries. They're going to cleave to them with flatteries. Does that make sense to people? So I just wanted to clear up this flatteries, the two different references. Yes, yeah, that makes sense. Uh when the papacy tortures people, they say, oh, you can get out of this if you recant and you accept all our doctrine, our rituals, etc." I was thinking of that, too, you know. Yeah, and, and it's not uh, torturing, though. I mean, it could be just, there's just the worldly honors, right? The education. Well, yeah, of course. You know, the, the granting of degrees and so forth, uh, which uh, never should have happened uh, within Protestant churches. It's something that's a holdover from the Catholic Church and from from all that stuff, right? Um, honoring man, right? I, I, I've never understood no. why Adventists are so interested in graduations, and uh, it's it's such a worldly thing because it's an intellectual religion. It's that's what it's become. Yeah, yeah. Well, isn't it also lifting up self? Well, yeah. Of course. Yeah, it's just, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of ceremonies at all. but And that's just, you know, I'm a little bit anti-disestablishment. Um, or I'm a disestablishment? Yeah, I'm a disestablishment. I'm anti-establishment. That's what I'm I know. I, <laughs> when I went to my son's grad, I'm mocking it. <laughs> I don't think he appreciated it. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure why, but even as a kid, like just any kind of ceremony, any sort of award night, you know, at school or whatever, 
I was not interested in that. It just always cut me the wrong way. And I'm not sure why, but I just never liked it. It just, just seemed distasteful, you know, to whatever sensibility that would had been brought up with. I think my parents obviously weren't all that interested in that kind of stuff either. But anyway, but these flatteries, they can have a powerful effect upon a person. And, and when I think about, uh, my daughters who were valedictorians in their respective years, they graduated from a Catholic school that their mom put them in, how that affected them, um, to have these worldly honors. It was, it was a way that they were caught, captured, right? Um, so these types of flatteries, the graduation and all this thing, people, I guess it appeals to human nature. Not, not the best part of human nature. Not that there is a great part of human nature. I mean, but there are some things about human nature that aren't terrible, like loving your children and things like that. There are some things which we call natural affection. But, but these are things that are a perversion of, of man's nature to receive honor and praise. So, so the, the idea of the flatteries here, I think, is, is been a problem within the movement. And, and we can see that, that there is this contrast here. So when we talk about, now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. You know, and we didn't really, so if we go back here, we can see there's this progressive destruction of four within this movement. Now we haven't really defined exactly where that occurs. We, we talked about it a bit, uh, some of these events. And uh, we definitely have this uh, uh, 6,501 days that's going to, uh, mark from 9-11 to the rejection of the Sunday law that I witnessed in this movement. Obviously, the rejection had been going on for a while, but we're going to see it there at the Alberta camp meeting. So me personally, that's when I'm discussing this for the first time with other people of, of what it is that Tess is teaching. And there is there is kind of a, an intellectual attraction to it. I'm not going to really go into why I... I was intrigued by the idea of of these other things being the issues, but I came to reject it over time just because there were some things that she was presenting that were interesting. I guess the one thing was uh, that Ellen White never talks about a Sunday law prior to the close of probation until the 1880s. That is initially when Ellen White talks about a Sunday law, it was always after the close of probation. It was always that Sunday law. The idea of the National Sunday Law uh, didn't happen within Adventist thought until after the Civil War and the failure of of the church, right? So the church, of course, is going to become an organized church. And so there are some things that she was saying that were true that um, that I think people hadn't noticed. And that was the intriguing thing for me. But anyway, that June 30th date, 2019. Uh, we've marked. But obviously, we could look at uh, the 7 7 structure itself and see along the way November 9th, July 18th, uh, December 25th, 2021. These are these steps. And, and so people could define them in different ways um, exactly where we would mark this progressive destruction of four, but it happened within the movement, however, we want to. Uh, define each of them but then if they're hoping with a little help now i'm saying here that there's exile from the movement leads to deep and deeper understanding but this help is an understanding if we're looking at that uh, footnote number 44 it's this understanding between 45 and 46 so the 45 years and 46 days 45 prophetic years that is 16,000 what was it, 16,246, if we add those, helping with a little help together, right? So we get that 45 years, prophetic years, and 46 days as symbols uh, that we can relate to the 1290 and the 1335 that are also going to be in verse 36. So hopefully that makes sense, the way I'm explaining this. So... But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. So there are, there's a group in, in our history 
Uh, so if we're going to talk about now, so it says here uh, to cleave, cleave to them. Well, that's not the faithful, right? So this was, I think, from, I don't know if this was Swearingen's uh, thing or I put that in there. So many are going to cleave to them with flatteries. So this wouldn't be the faithful that they cleave to. I don't know why I didn't correct this one earlier. This is going to be uh, those that, uh, what was the phrase, how did they word it? Such as do wickedly against the covenant. So it says, uh, if we go back here again, so, uh, and such as do wickedly against the covenant, shall he, the papacy, corrupt by flatteries. So those are going to be the ones that um, that they're going to cleave to. So they're going to cleave to them, the ones, I guess, yeah, I can't remember the word. Either. Okay, I'll just say, such as do wickedly against the covenant, but that would be a better way of doing it. Okay, does that make any sense? So historically, such as do wickedly, but many, so the many in the movement, so many historically, that's just going to be the majority of Christianity. So cleave to them, such as do wickedly against the covenant, with flatteries. So I think in our history, that's obviously just the majority in the movement. They'll just say the Paul's brethren. Just, I mean, we could define it in lots of different ways. Now, when we say, of course, some of the wise shall fall. Now, so we, we look at many and some as a contrast, right? Many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. You can see that there is a many, which is like the most, and then you have some, so that's going to be less. So we're going to have many that cleave to them with flatteries, and some, that is a few of them, of understanding. So we're saying the ones of understanding that is, now it's not just the leaders, but I, I don't know how to, to, to find that. What's, what's a good way to describe that? Because, so this falling here, so this is tottering and wavering. So it doesn't mean necessarily that they're all going to fall away when some of them of understanding shall fall. Because it says to try them, to purge them, and to make them white. Right? So obviously... It's, it's a trial that happens with two Christians in the past and within this movement, right? And so that fall can refer to, uh, you know, being a martyr historically. It can refer to a moral fall, so people falling away from the message. But it can just mean that, that they're going to stumble. They're going to fall. But, but God allows that. So it doesn't mean that they're still not, they're not going to be the wise anymore just because they fell. So some of them of understanding, some are going to go through this, this great tri type of trial. Now we're saying that this is a three step testing prophetic message to try to purge them to make them white. We can sit. And the way that I would look at it is that this is referring to specifically the 777 days. So. I would say, in a sense, all of us have had fallen, right, because of what had happened in the movement. You know, Parminder's message. Um, you know, so when I say false brethren, so Parminder would be an example of it. Is it IE or EI? I always get that mixed up. It's IE. So what does it mean again? In essence, or for example, or specifically, it can mean lots of different things, I guess. It est. In Latin, that is okay. So maybe it's so it's an example. I could put an example, but anyway, e.g., that's right. Now, now these flatteries from Isaiah 28, especially verse 13. Yeah. So Isaiah 28, we you know, dealing with uh, precept upon precept. So part of the problem here, you know, and if we say wickedly against the covenant. What is the covenant in this context here historically? So if we go, if we go back here and it talks about, um, 
and such as do wickedly against the covenant, shall he, the papacy, corrupt by flatteries. What is the covenant that they are doing wickedly against? Well, in a broad sense, just standing for God and the truth of his word. Okay, so you, you put in there his word. Is there a covenant regard in God's word regarding how to study God's word? Is that a covenant? I would think so, yeah. I think so. Uh, this word shall not depart from thy mouth, but I shall teach it to thy children, etc., etc. Right, so we have a can, can you read, read, um, um, ask that question earlier? Okay, so the question is just, does the covenant address God's word? Right, how we study God's word. We have the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Right. We actually refer to the scriptures as the covenant. So such as do wickedly against the covenant, that this is a rejection of God's word. Right? That's why it resolves in a Sunday law, which is, is the ultimate symbol of a rejection of God's word. Wouldn't wouldn't some, wouldn't it be if you if you um if you um say like if you refuse to not wait a minute if if you re, if you re, reject the way God has led you would that well yeah that would be part of it but it's it's but it's it's so God's leading but God leads through His Word I'm just saying that the covenant here is a reference to the Scriptures because you know if we put here such as do wickedly against the Testament. You know, if we put the word testament there, we would much more readily think of the Bible, right? The Old and New Testament, the Old and New Covenant, right? right. So when we start looking at, at this in, in our movement, the real problem that the movement has faced is how we study the Bible. That's, that's the problem Adventism has faced. Now, I'm quite particular about this issue. So... I think one is there was lots of things going on in the movement regarding what people imagined Miller's rules to be. That is, I call it maybe more sloppiness or being imprecise. That is, people would think they're following Miller's rules when they're not. And that's because they just didn't understand Miller's rules. And one thing I've noticed a lot is when people want to present something that's error, They will talk a lot about Miller's rules and then not follow them. It's just if you talk a lot and say you're following Miller's rules, it's sort of uh, you can pull the wool over people's eyes. You actually have to demonstrate that you're following Miller's rules. You can't just say you are. And, And I run into this all the time with different groups that, you know, are sort of offshoots of this movement. You know, there's one even called Miller's Rules uh, uh, Facebook page. And and these guys believe, you know, that the eclipse didn't happen on the 8th, that there was no eclipse. That was a fake, fake eclipse. And and their reasonings are so bizarre. But anyway, uh, when it comes to such as do wickedly against the covenant, we have to say that this, I'm, I'm going to word this a little bit differently. So them, I'm going to say it more like those that reject the true means of biblical interpretation. And that includes a lot of things. So if we think about the true means of biblical interpretation, the true way to study the Bible, There was a lot of lip service about methodology with Parminder's movement. Okay. And, and, you know, and they had the, you know, even all this stuff about the baptism, you know, baptismal vows, which were not very good and definitely didn't follow the counsel of the Bible or spirit of prophecy on baptismal vows. These are more like doctrinal statements, more like a creed, um, which they didn't follow anyway. They ended up rejecting it all in the end. And then, of course, all of this flatteries. Which, right? which, so you saw which a lot Baptist of flattery. Vows are you talking about? You talking about the one Paul Mendes set out? Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the ones part of the Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure because I know it's a, it was another set by Future for America that had a baptism of vows. Well, those are Paul Mendes. No, he made. It was another set made. 
after Paul Mendes. When? Uh, I think see. It was the um a couple of months for I think it was uh right after Paul Mender we had the split with Paul Mender and it was during um just before um November ninth. So, so why why would they create new baptismal vows? I don't remember. Because anything. I was baptized under that's why. I got them here somewhere. I don't know why they were baptizing people, to be honest. Well, I don't know well, they did because I was one of them. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I didn't think it was a good idea. So um I got the I got the baptism list here somewhere. Okay, well, yeah, so they changed his vows somewhat, hey? Eh? Or are they just completely different? Anyway, I, I think that baptismal it's vows... completely need, different from yeah. his. Yeah, baptismal vows need to be much simpler. Uh, they're not a doctrinal statements. Um, they're vows, right? It's quite a bit different. I mean, I can't remember how many. I think there was 13 vows when I got baptized. You know, just a basic profession of belief in Christ and, and Adventism and so forth, and then uh, lifestyle vows, right? Okay, so anyway, so we're going to say that they're going to cling to them with cleave to them with flatteries. So when I think about the flatteries that Parminder was pushing, it was in connection with the baptismal vows and. The, the correct methodology, and, and we saw this really manifest in at the end of uh, July in 2019. They had a question and answer period where Parminder was basically just saying, you know, if you want to be a part of this movement, you have to submit to leadership because you don't know how to study the Bible yourself. And so, you know, you need to go to a good school, have good teachers. And then once you have the correct methods that you've taught how to study, then you will agree with us. Right. The reason why you might not agree is just because you're not educated enough by us. Anyway, but but when I think about this flatteries is it's a false education. Okay, so we, we sort of discussed that. And that is a false methodology, right? It's something that's going to flatter, right? Rather than fit a person for service, it's, it's going to appeal to the worst parts of human nature. So then some of them of understanding. So we can see that there is a contrast between those that do wickedly against the covenant, holy covenant. And, and I'm just going to put here God's word. So we're going to just say God's word. And, and it's how they interpret God's word, right? And in our, our history, it's those that reject the true means of biblical interpretation. And that's going to include line upon line, right? Obviously, Isaiah 28 and or not Isaiah, Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28? Yeah. Uh, so line upon line. And then uh, uh, Miller's... Isaiah 28. What's that? Isaiah 28. It's Isaiah... It's Isaiah 28. Uh, okay, yeah, you're right. I always get mixed up because there's something in Ezekiel 28, I think. Or is it Isaiah... Ezekiel 14. It's Ezekiel. Anyway, Isaiah 28. Okay, yeah, you're right. Okay. So Miller's rules and uh, symbolic use of numbers and chronology, biblical chronology. I mean, I find it really strange when people say, you know, chronology is some evil thing. Without biblical chronology, we wouldn't have the 2300 days. We wouldn't have the 2520. We wouldn't have the 70 weeks. I've had people try to argue that you can't use any historical sources uh, to prove, prove Bible chronology, like to prove, prove the prophetic periods. So if you refer to any out thing outside of the Bible, like, you know, a date in history that you've stepped outside of the Bible, um, it's pretty bizarre. But, but 
some people are just very opposed to anything to do with numbers, anything to do with dates, even even dates that you know Adventists have had in the past that are obviously are based on history. Without without historical documents, we wouldn't have 457 BC. You know, um, to start the 2300 days in the 70 weeks. Psalm 39. Um, so we can start Theodore. That's what just comes to me. Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Mm-hmm. Like, how can they abandon what it plainly says in the word of God? We're to measure the days. And the more you study chronology and prophecy, well, hopefully it will teach us humility, how frail I am. Like our yeah. every dependence is on him. Yeah, so so to me, when we yeah, when we depend upon God, uh, I mean, the whole study of this message to me has been something that's uh, you know contrary to human nature and pride. Um, it shouldn't be making us puffed up, but uh, people can get puffed up by anything, I guess. Um, you know, because people can be proud that they're not educated. You know, for instance, they can say false education. That's you know, that just causes pride, but they can be just as proud as being not educated. I've seen that. But, you know, um, yeah. I'm sorry. I hate to hear it. I got them vows here. It's, okay. um, it's October, it's October the 26th. I think it's uh, October of that year of 2019. 19. Yeah. And, uh, you, you want me to read some of them? No, that's okay. It's 27 of them. Yeah, so they're like a statement of beliefs. They're not really baptismal vows. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, that goes against Ellen White's counsel on baptismal vows. But for some reason, the movement just ignored her counsel. Well, I reckon I'm guilty of that. Well, we're all guilty of it, right? I mean, I got baptized in the Parmenter's movement with baptismal vows, even though I... I uh, Protested some of his baptismal vows. I didn't. I didn't do it on the Paul Mendes movement. I did. But, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so now we got some of them of understanding shall fall. So we know that there is those that have understanding. So those are there are those that speak or that uh, do wickedly against the holy covenant, and there's going to be those that cleave to those. Right. So when we have people misinterpreting the scriptures in our history, uh, we're going to have people that are just going to be flattered. Right. And and I still it's it's so easy to not recognize how God, you know, so so God is trying to humble us. And we all know that we've been through some some experiences that definitely should have humbled us but human nature has a way of unhumbling ourselves right so we can be proud of the fact that we weren't deceived by parminder right or we could be proud of the fact that we didn't reject july 18 2020 and we still accept it right there's all of those things none of that the fact that we happen to know the truth has nothing to do with us being better than anyone else and, and obviously lots of things we personally believe are wrong. And there's lots of things in our lives that need to change. So none of this places us above our, our fellow men, right? We are all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The reason we're studying these things is because we are sinners and we need to be changed, right? And we want to be able to help others who are struggling with sin. So so we can see all of this false, what was happening in the dark ages was happening within this movement. So we can we can take this and put the time of the end at 9-11-2019, as you can see later here. So the messages of the 777 days, that is how we're interpreting these verses in placing it into this present truth it's very narrowly focused into this history that we have just passed. 
right? That's that's where we're placing it. Now, of course, it's talking about the Sunday law earlier, and we say, well, are we in the time of the Sunday law? Yes, since 9-11. So we can see that what's happening to the movement right now is still typical of what's going to happen on a much larger scale. So that means we probably could make an application of this in some other way. But for us, the symbols here are definitely applying uh, to this movement in, in this present history that we are in. And so, um, so if we're going to take these, uh, these three steps to try to purge and to make them white, I mean, that is the through the everlasting gospel, a three step testing prophetic message. Now, uh, a question that I have, because we, we, we look at Daniel 12 verse 10. Now, why does Daniel 12 verse 10 have them in the other order? To be well, not the other order, but in, in another order, in a different order, to be purified, made white, and tried. So, so the one is tried, purified, made white. The other one's purified, made white, tried is last. Then it talks, but the wicked shall do wickedly. So that's another thing is it's going to talk about this in the context of the wicked as well. None of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So we can see how Daniel 12 verse 10 fits with these verses here. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge them, to make them white, even at the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. So, um, and when they deal with this in verse 10 of Daniel 12, it's going to say, from the time that the daily was taken away to the abomination that make it desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So it's going to bring us to 1798. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred five and thirty days, and you know, bring us to 1844. So the question is, why is the order different? So that's the first question. Why didn't could Daniel it have something to do with? Could it have something to do with the chiastic structure? And it's like bookends. The beginning is this order, the end, and we're in the end times. As this order, it's mirroring it. Yeah. So and and now it, it translates a little bit differently. I mean, one says to to um, to try to purge to make them white. So in in chapter ten, it's going to be many shall be purified. So they're they're going to have that same word as purge. Purge and purified are going to be the same word. Thirteen oh five made white. Thirty eight thirty five and then tried six eight eight four. So the same words. But they're not just a, they're not a reverse order. It's just that the try in verse 10 of chapter 12 is the first one mentioned. The other one says purified, made white and tried. So at the end. So I don't know if a chiastic structure is quite the answer, though I think it's part of it. So one thing we can say here, I mean, we know that this is talking about this history. Between the end of the 1290 and the end of the 1335, or at least in that history, correct? In, in, in Daniel uh, 12 verse 10. So, because it's going to be talking about the 1290 and the 1335. So they're going to be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. So anybody got a good answer for us on this? Could the white be talking about E.G. White? Hmm? No. Okay. Uh, well, okay. So, so sometimes we take this, uh, this, you know, the idea of white, right? Do we get that from, um, the Laodicean message, right? As far as what, what is it in Revelation chapter three? What is the three things that are mentioned? Gold tried in the fire. So, so, White raiment and ISAV, correct? Let me see, I'll find it here. Okay. So come, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire. So we have this, this purging. This is the purification process that thou mayest be rich. White raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And then it has anoint thine eyes with ISAV that thou mayest see. So we can say that this has to do with understanding. So if we're going to 
we're going to try to take this counsel of Revelation 318. It's counsel, counseling us to do what? I mean, we look at the words it's saying, but what is it in, in reality? Because we're going to buy of him, Christ, gold tried in the fire that we may be rich. So how would we define that in more practical terms? Because this is obviously a symbol. So this is a refining process, right? And we're, we're to buy. Okay. So what is he asking us to do? Because, I mean, this is a symbol. So if we're going to buy of him gold tried in the fire, that means we're going to put all of our energies, everything that we have, we're, we're going to take up his cross. We could use other sort of analogies. But that means there's a, a commitment or a dedication to have our lives purified, to be purged, right? That's going to be trials, tried. And, and it's something we buy of him, right? That just means that there's a cost. Okay, now, of course, we can relate this to the spirit of prophecy, but the spirit of prophecy, the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans, right? That's the spirit of prophecy. We would agree with that. We can, we can see how these are symbolized here in the gold, gould, you know, Ellen White, the white raiment, and, of course, the eye salve, right? A, blight, a bright and shining light is what Ellen means. So we can see that, that this is spiritual discernment, uh, one is the ability to see your own sins, but also to understand his word, which, of course, go hand in hand. As you understand his word, you will see yourself as a sinner and you'll see what needs to change. And then we have, of course, white raiment. We know that that's that's something because we're naked without it. Right. So it's so that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. So we need Christ's righteousness, his right doing. So. We're committed to God. We go through trials. We have to obey him. But it's not something that we can do on our own, right? So we need Christ's righteousness. Because otherwise, all we have is the shame of our, our nakedness. And we need this spiritual discernment. We need an understanding of his word. God's word is a, a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. It shines more and more onto a perfect day. And it reveals, it shines into the darkness and shows us our sin. Okay. So all of those things in Revelation 3, verse 18, we, we would, you know, obviously see that that's connected with what we're studying here. Now, so if we go back and in verse 35 of chapter 11, and some of them of understanding. So we address this understanding, this 7919. So what was the understanding? Again, what did how how did we take that number? Seven nine one nine. What did we do with it? What, what did we do with that number? I'm trying to remember myself. There's something we did with it. Just trying to see. Did I put a chart in here? Maybe that one. I, I'm trying to remember now. Seven nine one nine. Uh, oh yeah, it's the thousandth prime number. That was what it was. So why is that significant? Anyone? Okay, so they that understand 7919, that's a symbol, we'll say the prime number, the thousandth prime number, the Y's, and we say it's the 144,000. Now, the Y shall understand, the 144,000 are represented there. Um, so with that thousand, anything else? Uh, with, with this one, the way that... Uh... That I understand that from uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. Um, Daniel mm -hmm. chapter 10, 12, uh, verse 10, and uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 9. I see that uh, it's uh, repeating Daniel chapter 12, verse uh, 3 and 4. Now, with this one in 9 and 10, it's more like upside down. The first okay. one is, is, uh, goes to the second, then the second goes to the first. So here we find that uh, when uh, it's referring to the time of the <coughs> sealed up to the time of the end, which is the uh, twelve, uh, which is the uh, twelve, twelve uh, sixty, then uh, this one, which simply means it's the one which is talking to these who are blessed because they are supposed to be patient, meaning they'll enter into a time of trial. 
but they are supposed to be faithful. But the wicked will not understand, and uh, we we understand that when you read Ellen White, she talks about Christ moving to the most holy place, and uh, those who are wicked, they meant at in the holy place when uh, Christ had moved into the most holy place. And what happened? We know that story there. So from this one, that's uh, the way that me yeah, I understand it. Okay. Yeah, so I think I understand what you mean. So so when we look at, at Daniel chapter 12, verse 10, 11, and 12, right? You have the 1290 and the 1335. And there's this, um, the time that the daily shall be taken away, the abomination that death was desolate, maketh desolate set up, which is 1290 years, right? And then you have the 1335. So we have that 45 years. Um, but go thy way till the end be, uh, verse 13, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. So this is, is referring to, uh, his, uh, now standing in his lot, what is that a re- reference to? Let's just deal with that one first. What does it mean that Daniel's going to stand in his lot? We've looked at this before. What is the lot that he stands in? Would we say that the messages of Daniel will become relevant for us today? Okay, well, you're sort of interpreting. I just want a more literal idea of what what it means to stand in his lot. What is the lot that he's going to stand in? We, We still use that word, you know, talk about a parking lot or an allotment. So what is the lot that Daniel is going to stand in? What's going to be allotted to him? Isn't this his... What? Sorry, it says read. I'm just reading H1486 in Esau. It says, Goral, from an unused room, meaning to be rough as stone, properly a pebble, that is a lot, small stones being used for that purpose. Figuratively, a portion or destiny. As if determined by law. Right. So initially they give them their land, their portion by lot, right? That is, it's chosen by lot. It's an allotment. Now, I don't know how it was in the United States here, but in Canada, back in uh, like the end of the 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s, you know, people who moved to Alberta, like my grandparents, they had... Basically, they just would go to the government, we want some land, and the government would just allot them a quarter section, right? So it was kind of done by lot. And sometimes people had to, uh, you know, some people didn't get land necessarily, or they didn't get land that they wanted. They said, well, you didn't get this land here, but you could get this other land. I wasn't around at the time, so I don't know all the details of it. But but the idea of him standing in his lot has to do with his inheritance, his portion at the end of days. So why is Daniel concerned about standing in his lot? Like, why would the angel come to him and tell him this? What is the what is the context? Well, maybe he would uh, maybe he maybe he would he they wanted to remember. He wanted to be remembered. Okay, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So think about it. He's in exile. He's looking for his inheritance. Now, he is not going to go back to the promised land, is he? He's an old man, right? He's going to die in exile, correct? Agreed. Okay. But he will stand in his lot at the end of days. So this is a reference to him inheriting his his eternal inheritance, right? It's going to be something that's eternal. Now, but we also apply it to this period of time from the end of the 1290 to the end of the 1335, right? Right. So there we have his, the, the, the literal application of it, if we want to call it literal, is that he's going to receive an inheritance that's eternal. Um, it's also mentioned earlier um let's see here well well don't they don't they require god to remember him 
I don't understand the question. Well, if he's old and he's fixing to die and he's not going to see the promised land, wouldn't God have to remember him in order to, in order, to, in order for him to inherit the inheritance? Yeah, but but I, I guess that nobody's understanding what I'm what I'm trying to say. Okay, so so it's it's ultimately relating to his eternal inheritance. So even though Daniel he's been praying for you know, the return of the people to the land, he's not going to personally return, but he will receive an internal inheritance. That's why it's mentioned to him. But it also is applying to uh, his message. So we know that um, the chapter 12, where it talks about many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt, right? But and they that be wise shall, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. So verse 4, we, we understand is connected to verse 13. For when it says, uh, thou shalt stand in thy lot at the end of the days. We refer it to the idea that his book is going to be unsealed at the time of the end. That's how Adventists understand it. Okay. Now, as a question, yeah. can we use and apply the rule of first mention in this situation? Yeah, of course. So you're going to go Leviticus 16, verse 8? Well, take... Take 16.8 through 16.10 as one explanation. Yeah, so so the word goral, according to my Strong's uh, King James Concordance, so I'll just show the screen here so you see what I'm looking at. So we got the word lot, 1486, goral. Uh, it occurs 77 times. In the King James. Okay. Which is a symbol that means nothing, of course. Yeah. And then 61 as lot and 16 as lots. Right. So that's a division uh, that we see in the 777 structure as 611 and 116. So that occurs in, in our structure. We can divide that in that way, just like we do 252 and 525 and 434 and 343. Okay, and it's Leviticus 16, 7 to 10. It's going to be mentioned five times. So it says, so take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And in verse 8, and Aaron shall cast lots, right? So that's actually the first time the word lot is used upon the two goats. And one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. So it's going to mention lots and then lot and lot. So it's going to be in verse eight. Now, one, six, eight is the number of hours in a week. And it's also the Hebrew one, six, eight is the number for the word tabernacle. Right. So if you look at this verse here, I'll click on this here. So you're going to see, um, it's in this verse, 168, right, that we're going to first see the word lot. And then in here, in verse 7, where it starts talking about the, the two goats and casting lots for them, it's going to have the word tabernacle, which means a tent, right? So that's 168. It's the number of hours in a week, right? So we can see the 168 is represented here. And this, of course, is the two classes of worshipers. We have the Lord's goat and the scapegoat. Now, I believe that this the Lord's goat represents the 144,000. That is, Christ's character perfectly reproduced in his people. That is, you can't have the Lord's goat till after the close of probation and Christ saying that him that is righteous be righteous. Though. Now, the scapegoat, that's Satan and all of his followers. Now. Each of them have to suffer themselves. Now, of course, it's primarily Christ and Satan. Um, but you can see how this, this all ties together. Just from this symbol 
of Lot and then the 168. Right? We can see how this all, all fits together. Hopefully we can see that. And that this ties into the 777 structure for us. So the symbols, remember, we're using these symbols as applying to the present truth application. Right? These, these symbols were given to this movement, I believe, to use the Hebrew numbers, to use the verses and so forth, to understand our history. This wouldn't be the primary way that we would look at every single verse in the historical application, you see that sometimes we do use it, but it's often much more applied to the present truth application. So we can see that this is the separation of the two classes. There's the Lord's goat and the scapegoat, and that there's lots that are cast, and that this has to do with the understanding of God's word, right? Because when Daniel stands in his lot, that's when the book of Daniel is going to be understood. So he's going to, he's going to stand in his lot. In a sense, he receives an inheritance in the Millerite time period, not personally, because that's referring to, you know, obviously eternity. But as far as his book is concerned, that's when the book of Daniel is going to be opened, right? So we've always understood that as Seventh day Adventists. And we can see that we can take these symbols and apply it to this movement. Now, if we take uh, 168, that, that word tabernacle, so, or, or we could just take Leviticus 16, verse 8. If you take 168 and you multiply it by 77, what do you get? You, you probably don't remember. But if you take 77 times 168, you're going to get... 12936. 12936 is my home address growing up. Right? Now, now how is that significant? Why, why would my home address matter in the context of what we're talking about here? I mean, it's just it's just a number. <clears throat> we used it when we were studying judges. With the, with the Hebrew number 168. <clears throat> we see it here again in Leviticus 16, verse 8. So what's the significance of my home address? Like, why is that important? Well, it's, it's placing relevance to a lot of the things that you've been helping to uncover. And it, it's a symbol, right? It just shows that a home, a tent, right? A tabernacle or a tent multiplied by 77 can reveal for me personally my home that i grew up in that that still is important to me even though they tore it down last year but of course they're building a, an apartment building with that address so even though there was two houses torn down the address that i had is the one that's going to survive but um but it's it's a symbol of something right it's a symbolic number in a sense it represents my lot right Okay. Now, yeah. with what, with what we're looking at here, mm -hmm. when, when I looked at this in the rule of first mention, yeah. we have lot or lots being mentioned a total of five times. In so, the, in, in that, in that series seven, of verses. Yeah. Right. Now, seven to, which represents the 10th day of the seventh month. Right. <laughs> But yeah. five being also the number of the wise and the foolish virgins. Yeah. Now, the other question that I have, mm -hmm. using the rule first mention, is Daniel's lot <clears throat> to be the equivalent of the goat for the Lord? Um, okay. I'm not sure I understand that question. Okay. All right. At the end of time, the 144,000 are going to stand and represent Christ. Is that not correct? Yeah, that's correct. Now, was Christ sacrificed for the sins of humanity? Mm -hmm. Therefore, is Daniel being told that his lot, since this is typifying the 144,000, yeah. Is, going, is going to typify him as a sacrificial goat 
before humanity so that they will see the perfection of Christ's character in other human beings. Okay. So, so if we, not Daniel as a person, but Daniel's message. Thank you. Okay. Right. So the Thank message of the book of Daniel is this message of the separation of the two classes, especially when we deal with chapter, well, chapter 11 and 12, Daniel's last vision, right? We, we can see that clearly. I mean, that's one of the things that's just evident as we, we look at this. So uh, I know Angela's putting a bunch of verses there, but uh, it's Jeremiah 1, verse 5 and 10. Okay. And, and she did reference Hebrews chapter 11, which uh, we've looked at before. So the idea here, because this is an answer to the question about the order of of these things. So we have basically three verses that we looked at to address uh, this purification process. So Daniel chapter 11, verse 35, right? Try them, purge them, make them white. And then chapter 12, verse 10, purified, made white and tried. And then we, we connected this to, um, uh, to Daniel standing in his lot, that this has to do with God's word. And it has to do with like the spirit of prophecy, right? So we could connect it to Revelation 13, 13, 3, verse 18. So there is, okay, okay. So when we look at purified, that's, that's the refining process. The white, that's the righteousness of Christ. And tried. Now, I think the idea that this is a chiasm, uh, sort of addresses this. That is, in in our history, is the trying at the end, where in uh, the 1260 period, the trying's more at the beginning. Does that make sense? All right. Because when when are we going to have most of our martyrs? Did we have many martyrs in the Millerite history? No. But we are going to have martyrs in, martyrs in our history. Correct. Yeah. So the purified and the made white, that's part of Millerite history, but the persecution is not. That's going to be in our history. In, in Daniel chapter 11, where it taught in verse 35, where it talks about this, some of them understanding shall fall to try them, right? So one of the first thing that's going to happen is persecution. God's people are going to be martyrs. There's going to be lots of martyrs in that history, just as there were martyrs before. But we really haven't had martyrs. I mean, obviously, there are people who are martyred here and there, right? They do exist in our day. But we're going to see the majority of the martyrs in that period during the loud cry to the close of probation. And and so that type of trying, because that's what I think the trying refers to, is, is primarily to that type of persecution. Now, of course, we're saying that many of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge them, make them white. We're saying that this is the Millerite history. But but I'm still thinking that the trying is that period during the 1260. The purging and the making them white is uh, is more part of Millerite history. So the first angel's message in this case is the trying. The second is the purging. And the third is the making white. That's the righteousness of Christ, the third angel's message. In uh, this history, just as symbols, doesn't mean that, you know, the messages are in a different order or anything, but to be purified in our history. So, so I'm just saying that this Daniel 12 verse 10 is addressing, of course, Millerite history. So is the other one. But this one is primarily more focusing upon what's going to happen at the end. That is, even though Daniel goes to the end of the 1335, we can see that this is still ultimately applying to us now, right? That is, Daniel is more understood in our time than in Daniel's day. That is, there is a present truth application of Daniel 12, verse 10, right? The repeat of history. 
So even though we on the surface, we can say, well, this is death. This is Millerite history, Daniel 12. We can actually say that this is more our history, especially as we look at the symbols. So Daniel standing his lot at the end of the days in Millerite history, his book is understood. But is Daniel going to stand in his lot at the end of the days as a person? Is Daniel going to be part of a special resurrection? Is he going to be there when Christ returns? What's the answer to that question? Will Daniel be there when Christ returns? Will he be of those that sleep in the dust of the earth, that awake some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt? Yes, he will be. Yeah. So he's going to be there to see to see Christ return. Now, we know that everyone's going to be at Christ's second coming, that they're going to be resurrected. But the question is, is Daniel going to be in the special resurrection that's referred to in verse 2? And we say yes. um, Uh, I don't know this. uh, Can I ask this question? (laughs) Um, How do we know Daniel is going to be in that last resurrection? In the special resurrection. Special resurrection. How How do we know that he didn't, he didn't, he ain't already there? as far as him being a part of the um, 24 elders. Okay. Yeah, me. You know what I'm uh, talking about, right? You're talking about, yeah, I'm talking talking about, about Well, the 24 elders, so you're saying that, you know, wasn't he resurrected? And Jesus, Christ? yeah, first fruits. Okay, so was Daniel buried in Jerusalem? I don't know. I don't know where he's buried. No. Well, we would say probably not. He would be buried in Babylon where he died. I mean, Maybe they carried his bones there, but I doubt it. So, so the ones that are in that, that, that resurrection when Christ is resurrected, they, that was in Jerusalem. I'm not trying to doubt on that because I know he is, but I'm just wondering if, okay, yeah, if you if, have any, any, any Ellen White quotes or, um, if well, that's, saying, well, that's kind of the question I'm asking is, is, um, I know he's going to be there. I'm, di- I'm not trying to doubt anything. I'm just, I'm just, you know, if you tell people this, you got to have a proof where you can find it, right? Yeah. You, you, you know what I'm saying? The special resurrection and. Yeah. Um, with uh, Daniel chapter 12, chapter 12 uh, verse uh, 3, that's a uh, special resurrection, right? Or verse uh, 2. Two, yeah, verse two, that's, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Sister White uh, says, uh, those who died under the third angel's message. Right. And the now, ones who are going to be resurrected in the first, in the special partial. Right. Now, now Daniel didn't die under the third angel's message. So the question is, is he going to be at the special resurrection? Do we have some way of showing that? No, no. Uh, I personally have never come across that. Okay. See, I, I take it, see, I, I, I've always taken that last verse to say that. When it says, thou shalt stand in thy lot at the end of the days, I've always taken it that way, but I could be wrong, right? So it's one thing we're going to have to look at before You're tomorrow. not wrong, Theodore. I wasn't saying you was wrong. I was just saying that, you know. Well, I want to be able to show it. Yeah. In the yeah. statement. No, I wasn't yeah. trying to place doubt on it. I just, I just wanted to. It just popped into my head just to ask, you know, if it, if he's going to, and we know he's going to stand in his lot at the end. All right. So, all right. I'm going to ask my question. So. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I'm going to have to look at that tomorrow and uh, see if we can show that. That's how I've always taken it. But we'll come back to this. We'll try to tie up some of these loose ends tomorrow to do a summary. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning, for each person who is searching things. And we just pray that you can continue to lead and guide in our personal study and in our lives. We ask for your angels' care and protection and help us in the trials that we face each day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.